I'm going to go ahead and start recording. And we're now on the second week, so we're just checking to see if there's anybody new on the class, how you might have found out about them and why you might like to benefit from the class. It looks like I don't see anybody new jump down here. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I think I recognize all the names. Okay. So we'll go ahead and uh, continue on. Uh, anybody have any questions before we get started? Any thoughts or suggestions? Okay. Okay, Alice. So I'm really trying, not vegan yet, but I have... <laughs> definitely increased my lentils and beans and wheat berries and you know all kinds of stuff your fiber has dramatically increasing and i'm just gonna put it out there i have a lot of gas yeah so um, you've got if you think about this like you have a bacteria in your microbiome that have populated your large intestine. And, you know, they're the kind that are used to eating the meat, dairy, eggs that don't have so much fiber. And so now those bacteria are at war with the bacteria that are trying to take over, the ones that are the fiber eaters. So, yes, you're going to have a little gas for a while and then it's going to dissipate. Well, how, how long is a while? Well, a while could be a few days. It could be a few weeks. It just uh, depends on on um, your individual body. And uh, Dr. Greger on his nutritionfacts.org site has a video. I don't know what it's called on gas, uh, where people right. are, you know, kind of comp the comparison. And Scott has told us about this before, too, that... Um, you know, you're changing your diet, so you're kind of recognizing certain differences, but it's really not that much difference, according to the studies that have been done. Eat, eat slow and chew well, because that most most gas is caused by swallowed air, eating too fast and not chewing well enough. But it's not, that's what the studies actually show, more so than how much fiber you're eating and what your food you're eating and this and that. So you know, take that to, to heart. Kudos to you for uh, increasing the fiber in your diet. Some people say just do five grams a week uh, so that it may kind of reduce that. And you're, it sounds like you've gone all in, which I chose to do uh, and survived. Um, that was 12 years ago. Um, but, you know, uh, just... Give yourself a little time. I had one patient I recall distinctly, not a patient, a class member, back around, I don't know, 10 years ago, he complained, I had this diarrhea I never had before. And it went on for several weeks, maybe two and a half months. And then I kept telling him just, you know, it'll go away. And it finally did. And he just came to class after class saying how uh, much better he was feeling. And he, you know, it, it's... Fortunately, most people don't have that. Well, so the other thing, and maybe, uh, so I'm training for a half marathon, and I'm also training for a couple of um, multi-day bike rides, and I, I find I'm really hungry, like more hungry. Like, yes, I've stepped up. I'm used to eating cheese and meat and um and they tend to fill me more um i don't feel as full and i have stepped up my training the weather's gotten better and i you know training harder and i know that but i'm i feel hungry where when i if like let's say that i did something pretty vigorous and i had like a hamburger i would be very full for i would be more full Scott, so, do you want to deal yeah, with that? So make, yeah, so make sure you're eating lots and lots of starchy vegetables. So your potatoes, okay. sweet potatoes, your yeah. of course your beans and your lentils, uh, whole grains. You, you might even, because if you're burning a lot of calories, you might even 
want to make sure you're eating plenty of nuts and seeds, nut butters, avocados, even pasta and bread, you know, because if your weight isn't an issue for you and you're burning a lot of calories exercising, then you might want to go heavier on those starchy vegetables and those minimally processed uh, plant foods like the bread and the pasta and stuff like that, just so you get more calories in per bite because, you know, your stomach only has so much room. And so if you're eating huge salads and eating too many non-starchy vegetables, which is basically all the other vegetables, you're likely not getting enough calories. It's taking up a lot of space in your stomach, making you feel full, but because there's so few calories, an hour or two later, you're going to be hungry again. So, and that's when people tend to reach for things like meat and dairy and some of the processed foods, which, you know, you don't want to do that because, because of the health problems. So uh, but yeah, make sure you're getting a lot of those, those starchy vegetables. Like when I'm doing longer distance bike touring and stuff. I have a, you know, like a, this trail mix I make, which has got all kinds of mixed nuts and raisins and, and I'll be snacking on that a lot. And then, um, and I'll make sure I like, I'll eat sandwiches with like avocado and cucumber and hummus. And, you know, and, uh, so you kind of have to eat foods that are a little bit higher or even, you know, peanut butter sandwiches, things like that, that are a little bit higher in calorie density to make you feel full, more full and satisfied. Hopefully that helps. Well, weight is always an issue for me. <laughs> yeah, so we got to be careful because if you're, yeah, if you're trying to lose or maintain your weight, uh, then you don't can't go too heavy on those foods if you're starting to gain weight. But it's just a matter of that finding that balance if you are exercising heavily. Try a few more potatoes. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're not gonna. You know, they're pretty reasonably. I don't know if they're in the four or five hundred calorie range. Per pound. Yeah, 400, yeah, 400 to 500 calories a pound for potatoes. Whereas like nuts are 2,800 calories a pound and bread is 1,200 calories a pound and avocado is about 700 calories a pound. So you, you know, you got to be a little bit more careful there with those. But yeah, potatoes is a good way to go because, you know, potatoes and beans, for example, are you know, four to 500 calories a pound, which if you watched my calorie density lecture a few weeks back, I kind of have those calorie density breakouts for this, the controlled studies they did to see who gained weight, who lost weight, who maintained weight, all those types of things. So you can go back to that lecture uh, if you missed that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, it's important for others to hear the challenges uh, connected with transitioning and uh, we encourage you to keep at it. Uh, Marsha. Have you ever heard of someone doing calorie deprived to lose weight? I was that's talking what, to a nurse yesterday and she said that's what she was doing. Yeah, that's calorie I mean. deprived <laughs> means that your body says, I don't like this one little bit. And what happens is that winds up in a yo-yo, lose weight, gain more weight, lose weight, gain more weight, yo-yo <laughs> dieting is something that we try to avoid. Yeah, I I had a chance to say something something to her yesterday, but but I didn't. <laughs> I you know instead I should could have said do calorie density instead, but I let it pass. Well you are learning and that's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I kind of talk about there's three philosophies in with for weight loss. It's either you're either just totally calorie counting and cutting calories no matter what and eating kind of whatever you want but but cutting calories which is the worst way to go because like charlie said you'll just yo-yo diet because you'll be starving and it's not sustainable then there's low carb which is using ketosis to lose weight so that, that's a whole nother topic and then the third is the calorie density which ultimately is a type of calorie restriction in some ways but you're eating as much as you want until you feel comfortably full yeah you're eating foods that are lower in calorie density so you ultimately are eating less calories, but you get to feel just as full as if you were eating foods that were higher in calories because you're you're eating more volume of foods, so you're filling up your stomach. And so calorie density kind of gets its own category, even though somebody's eating switch to switching to a more plant-based diet, they'll, they're probably eating less calories than they were before, but they're eating more volume of food. So they get to be more feel more full at a lower calorie cost because the foods are so high in nutrients and low in calories. So I need to share my uh, two uh, 
success stories with you over the last week. I was out washing my car two days ago and a neighbor walks by and he was a neighbor who uh, I met when I went out to get my own mail uh, about a month and a half ago or a month ago. And um, he says, you know, you've been telling me about this uh, eating more plants and I'd like to talk to you about it. So I invited him, he came over to my house. We spent 45 minutes together. I gave him, uh, uh, loaned him a copy of Dr. Greger's How Not to Die. Um, he had uh, concerns about kidney disease and diabetes and those things. And so he saw me uh, washing my car and he said, so I've been reading the book and I've been enjoying with reading about the science and I've changed my diet considerably. I'm going to get blood tests with my kidney doctor tomorrow. And by the way, I lost 10 pounds and I'm really feeling much better. So that was one success story that really made me want to teach another class. And the second one was an email that I received a couple days ago. It says, hi, Dr. Ross. I spoke with you March 5th. That's two weeks ago. And I just wanted to report in and tell you the progress I've made. I, she was a person who her doc, she had so many medical problems. Her doctor had told her, have you gotten your affairs in order? Um, and she says, I am just not ready to die. I've got a grandchild on the way. And we talked for about 45 minutes to an hour. She says, I'm following the diet very closely and have lost 12 pounds. I do feel better. She said, uh, I've only been taking two nitro glycerin pills since I started the diet. She was taking them multiple times, uh, most every day before that. She says, I have more energy and I am now taking several walks a day around our five acres. I haven't been able to do this for several years. I'm excited. Thanks so much for helping me. I'll stay in touch. You think it makes me want to teach another class? <laughs> it does. Okay, with that said, last week we spent some time talking about stress, and I'm going to do a brief review. But before we do that, we did go over kind of some deep breathing last week. But this week, I want to start the session a little differently. I want to start the session out. Some of you are familiar with mindfulness and meditation and those sorts of things. And I found a... a a mindful meditation. It's a five minute by Dr. Amit Sood, which I'm gonna to play to start out our session here, mainly because I like to go over a technique that you could choose to use. Now, some of you will say, there is no way I'm gonna do this. And you know, I get that. What does my shirt say? It says blue zones in project in Umqua. It's from Roseburg. Uh, that's what the shirt is all about. Anyway. Um, when I tried to do meditation, I couldn't do it for a minute or two. When I started out, it was like, I couldn't sit still for that long. And, you know, my wife could do it for 15 or 20 minutes. And I just was a little competitive. And I took this video kind of, or something like this to kind of get me on track. So let me play it for you. You can follow along. It's only five minutes. It won't destroy your life. Um, there, it's not religious, but I want you to focus on the, the flower, uh, really, you know, get a focused mind about being here and now, instead of thinking about all the we yard work you need to do and all those other kind of things. So I'm going to share my screen first of all, and we're going to play it. And then we're going to get back with you very soon. So let's see if it'll play. And the only way it's going to play is if I push this. Let us settle ourselves in a quiet, safe and comfortable place. Start your practice by welcoming this lovely hibiscus that is slowly waking up to the world. Notice the five overlapping petals. Notice their color, the shallow wrinkles on their surface, and folded wavy edges. Notice also 
the still leaves in the background. When you are ready, gently close your eyes, making sure your eyelids are only lightly touching each other. Now, we will synchronize our breathing with the two flute sounds. This is the sound for breathing in and this is the sound for breathing out. Begin slow deep breathing, synchronizing your breath with the two flute sounds. Inhale Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Make sure your eyes are relaxed with your eyelids only lightly touching each other and your face has a gentle smile. Now we will calm and energize our heart. Follow your breath from the tip of your nose to the deepest place in your heart. With the breath flowing in, imagine your heart is recharging with calming, soothing energy. With the breath flowing out, imagine your fatigue and hurts are all melting away. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Make sure your eyes are relaxed with your eyelids only lightly touching each other and your face has a gentle smile. Now, think about one person you know who truly cares about you. Bring that person's face in front of your eyes. And then send that person your silent gratitude. Imagine that person is being protected for the week with the energy you just sent. We will now transition out of the meditation practice. Set up positive intention for the rest of the day. Then, when you're ready, you can open your eyes. I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay, so we're going to stop. And now that we've got you a little warmed up, that's one of the techniques that we uh, we'll mention uh, later on. Uh, we've got a lot of things to talk about. And um, I'm going to see, Scott, did you want to share that information about what's going on in the future since we've got a pretty full class right now? Sure. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> Take it. They're all in the moment, ready to watch what you're doing. <laughs>
go to the let's go here. Here's the class website, but also a lot of you are familiar with the Eugene Plant Based Providers website, which is just eugeneplantbasedproviders.com. You can get to it through its own website, or you can click the link here on the homepage of the class website. And so go to upcoming events, and I'll have this information in the Sunday morning class newsletter every week too, but come to upcoming events. We just posted a couple of events coming up. And so there's gonna be a, a grocery store shopping tour. We've done these in the past uh, with uh, Sean Egglestone and Karen Booth, two dietitians. They're both dietitians at McKenzie Willamette Hospital. And uh, for free, they are they're gonna they do these uh, grocery store shopping tours. So it's limit, limited to the first 20 people that sign up. So if you're interested, just put your name and email here and click send. And it's gonna be on Wednesday, April 24th at six o'clock at the Safeway on Cobra Road. So if you're interested in that, he'll take you, they'll take you around and kind of do aisle navigation, how to choose the best and worst you know, foods, the, the, how good carbohydrates, bad carbohydrates, good fats, bad fats, some of those types of things, some of those myths and whatnot. But um, it's really label reading and just lots of good information that they'll share with you. So uh, take advantage of that. So sign up for that if you'd like. And then, uh, then we'll be starting our community walks every month, starting in May. We always go May through October. So we're going to continue to do them at the South Eugene High School track there. You just meet at the parking lot at the 20, corner of 24th and Amazon, 11 o'clock, Saturday, May 18th. So put, I know it's a little ways off, but put it on your calendar. And, and it generally it's the third Saturday or the second to last Saturday of each month that we have it from May through October. So Good, good time to get together. We walk around the track. People can go whatever pace they want. There'll be lots of the Eugene plant-based providers there. So we, we can answer your questions and we can chat and, and just be a community together and do a little movement and answer questions. So, so there's that. And then of course we have the also put, um, most of you know about the, uh, the YMCA classes as well and sign up for that is still on the, homepage here, the uh, um, the, the, the uh, YMCA class right here. You can see the class flyer here. We're gonna start a new series on April 14th. So two weeks after Easter weekend, and uh, we'll have a longer class instead of eight weeks, we're gonna plan to do 12 weeks and we have different speakers all the time. We're definitely gonna have a, yeah, we'll have some cooking demonstrations throughout and we're gonna have a potluck at the end and. Um, and show a movie and so it'll, so it'll be a lot of fun so uh, you can sign up for that by through the, the home actually also on the home page you can either email charlie or i which our emails are here on the flyer as well as on the uh, class website under about us we also have our charlie and i have our emails there as well uh, or you could just sign up right on the the home page of eugene plant-based providers also so if, since i was just there i should have showed you that also, but here's back to Eugene plant-based providers. And here it is for your in-person classes. You can also sign up here with your name, your full name, phone number, and your email and click send. And you can also sign up for that. And that'll uh, be again, April 14th when the new series will start. We still have one more class this coming Sunday, uh, physical activity with our uh, physical therapist, Kathy Meldrum. She's teaching the, lot, the eighth and final class for this round. But again, we'll be starting it all over again April 14th. So take advantage of all those free resources. And it's just a way to kind of get together as a group. And you, know, you found your tribe here and we're trying to do more and more things together as a group so we can support each other. And that's it. Thank you, Scott. Anybody have any questions about any of this? You can raise your hand or unmute and speak up. Okay, uh, you'll have time again. Oh, okay, Galaxy Tab. Oh. <laughs> uh, is that meditation available on the web page? Uh, no, it's called Recharge 5-Minute Meditation on uh, YouTube by Amit Sood, S-O-O-D. And uh, we're going to talk about him in, in just a bit. He has this Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living, 
and I think his name is here on the bottom of the page, Sood, S-O-O-D. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, so last week we talked about stress, and I hope uh, that uh, after listening to Kelly McGonigal that you came away with the concept that it's how you actually think about stress that may determine whether you are healthy or ill. Um, that um, that might be have been a surprise to a number of you, but if you didn't see the video by her, uh, it's how to make stress your friend. It's on the website and I encourage you to all look at it. Now, not everybody is able to successfully alter their thinking uh, like just because they learn about it. And so there are other techniques that you can use to reduce your stress level. But while you're doing this reduction of your stress level, try to keep in mind that if you keep a mindset that while you're reducing your stress, that perhaps this your body's response really may be helpful for you, uh, that may help you from becoming ill. Uh, so you can use a combination of things. We didn't really get into ACEs. That's um, the acute um, life events that ca can lead to uh, poor physical and mental health. These are things that people the uh, are experience when they're kids or growing up. But as an adult, about six of 10 of us have experienced a, um, I can't remember the exact name of this. Uh, Scott, do you Adver remember? Adver adverse Ad childhood events. Yeah, the adverse childhood events. And not, the first one is experiencing abuse or neglect. Some of you may have experienced that. Experiencing or witnessing violence in your home. Family member attempts to dies by suicide. And the fourth is a household has substance use, um, mental health problems or instability like parent separation or a household member incarcerated. So I did a little poll last week of the members that showed up in the afternoon session. There were, I think, nine of us and uh, six of us had uh, at least one or two of these events. And one person had all four as she was growing up. So these can really impact your health over time. And how often does your provider actually ask you about these issues? How often have you actually addressed them, perhaps with a counselor or with cognitive behavioral therapy? I know for myself, I haven't really addressed them very much. I know when I go to the doctor, I don't get screened for anxiety or depression. Now we do that screening in volunteers and medicine uh, for just about every patient who comes in. But I'm, I don't know, I guess I'm kind of curious, but I don't expect anybody to answer this. Just think about it. How often are you, are, have you been screened by your doctor for anxiety and depression with a patient health questionnaire. And what would be on that questionnaire would be something like this. Over the last two weeks, have you been feeling nervous or anxious? Uh, okay, I just have to go. Have you been nervous or anxious or on edge? Not being able to stop or control worrying. Feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Or little interest or pleasure in doing things. There are four issues, four questions. And how you answer those questions results in a score. So if you're asked over the last two weeks, how often have you been feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge? If you say none at all, not at all, you'd get a zero score. If you say nearly every day, your score would be three. And then, you know, if you've had it for several days, it might be one, 
your score might be two if it's more than half the days. And so you add those scores up and zero to two is normal and above three, you start getting into mild, moderate or severe depression. The higher the score, the more severely depressed, the more closely you should be watched and have a discussion on how to deal with this. So go ahead, Marsha. I went to the doctor yesterday and, uh, and I do an e-check-in and they had some of those questions, but none of the answers fit mine. There was not at all, several days, not at all, or something else, but mine was maybe one, two days and it did not fit. So I put not at all. Okay, so again, uh, if you were probably anxious or depressed, uh, perhaps uh, you might have put that or you could have had the opportunity to discuss this with your doctor provider to say, you know, none of these really fit, but I do have episodes where I'm having this, that or the other thing. So I'm glad to hear that your doctor or provider is screening for that. All right. We didn't get a chance to talk about those answers, but we did something else, which I won't go into right now. So, yeah. yeah, so that's one of those things that happens. Uh, if you have a provider, they may make a little notation at the next visit. We'll discuss this. That sort of thing is how you kind of close the loop on this. You may not be able to get to everything at every visit, but hopefully you're being screened. If you're not being screened, bring it up with your provider. Uh, let them know that you're having some issues perhaps with anxiety or depression and uh, they can refer you if they don't have time to deal with it themselves. Uh, generally, uh, there are people who you can be referred to. Unfortunately, it may be a few weeks to a few months before you can get in to see uh, people in this uh, sick care system that we have. But right. yeah. yeah, actually that's what I went in for is to talk to her about the test, or we're going to do an MRI. We're going to... Okay. And so she flat out said no to that test that you suggested. Okay. All right. Well, then you just uh, go with the program and see what happens over time. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully... <laughs> All right. All right. So the next issue is, is I want to get back to the not the video, uh, med the meditation, but I want to get back to Amit Sood because he kind of changed my life. He's one of my mentors. And the book that changed my life is his book, The Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living. He had some really wonderful examples, which I was able to connect with. And I've shared this with a number of people who have also uh, felt that it's been a helpful resource to them. Uh, it may or may not be helpful to you, but what he initially talks about is our brain. It has a, a focused mode and a wandering mode. The focused mode in our brain is when we are living in the moment. We are, you know, out in nature, listening to the birds. We're looking at the sky, watching the clouds in their different formations, smelling the smells of the pine in the forest, or we're sitting at the dinner table and we're, we're looking at the beauty of the food that we're about to eat and the smell that it's so good. We're not thinking about we need to pay a bill or we need to go to get the dog groomed or any of those other things. We're living in the here and now staying present. That's the focus mode. Well, as it turns out, if we don't stay in the focus mode, and it takes practice to stay in that mode, our brain will revert to what's called the wandering uh, mode, or the default or wandering mode. The default mode or wandering mode is it will default back to all the problems we have in the world. Like when we're living out in the forest, our ancestors, we were trying to think about every threat available, the lions, the tigers, the snakes, the ants that were biting on us and, 
and trying to devour us. And so our brain is constantly on the alert for things that we need to solve. And each of us has about 150 open files that need to be addressed at some point. Everything from the repairs on our house to the bills that need to be paid to the difficulties we have with various relationships in our life to what the meaning is in our life, you name it. We've got about 150 of those. And so our brain will track right back to one of those areas. And we will be thinking about what happened in our life in the past, or we will be focusing on, on what potential disaster may happen in the future. We're not like those animals who are running away from the lion on the savanna, but we sort of are because the lion is now all these 150 files that are chasing after our brain. And what is that doing to us? It's sort of sucking the life out of us, sucking us into a black hole, leading to potentially anxiety and depression and those sorts of things. So he said, so what do you do to get yourself out of this? You train your brain and you spend time in the focus mode, thinking about what is happening right here and now. What do you see now? What do you hear now? What do you feel now? What do you smell now? This takes practice. You know how many of you get into your car and you drive to the store or to work and then you get there you don't remember the trees you saw. You don't remember anything. You've been thinking about what you're going to do at work or what you have to do. You're not in the focused mode. And what he's recommending is that you spend time thinking about the feel of the road on the tires, looking at the trees as you're going by and focusing on the cars and the people around you when you're driving. So just a thought as to what you might consider practice. So he recommends one of the healthiest things is to focus your attention on nature and on thoughts that are bringing you joy in your life. And he says, if you want to practice, if you want to practice being in the moment, and if you want to practice the things that will take the junk out of the trunk, <laughs> and we'll get to that in a minute because we kind of started out with that. Uh, he starts out with being grateful. So in the morning, he describes it very well in his book. He thinks about five people or things that are important to him. And before he ever gets out of bed in the morning, he focuses his attention on, on these five things. And so when I get up in the morning, I focus my attention. I think about my wife who's sleeping next to me and how important she's been to, to me in my life. I think about uh, the work, like these classes, particularly on a day that we have a class about what kind of stories we're gonna hear and what joy it brings to me and meaning into my life. And then I think about my grandkids and uh, what joy they brought to my life. And then my kids and my kids kind of go below the grandkids because they're a little more stressful actually than the grandkids. But uh, still I've found a lot of joy from from raising them. And then I might think about, uh, you know, the I used to be thinking about my dog uh, we, who passed away uh, several months ago. Um, and so I replace that with whatever I wanna do for the day, whoever I've met or thought about. I do five, just like he recommends before I get out of bed. And I'd encourage you to do the same thing. What you're grateful for. Uh, is an important concept. And I must tell you, 
there are, have been a couple people I've asked in the practice who've come into me and have been depressed. And I ask them, is there anything you're grateful for that you, you know, are happy about or enjoy? And I've had a couple people tell me nothing. When they tell me nothing, uh, my palms start sweating because I think these people are at truly very high risk for uh, harming themselves or others. And I really pay particular attention. Most everybody will come up with something. Once they come up with something, they can kind of keep tracking from there to other activities that they can incorporate into their life or other people that can bring them joy and can take them out of this black hole that they find themselves in. All right. Another thing is compassion. He says, this is important to develop in practice. And we've all been in line at the grocery store or somewhere. And there's a person in front of us who's fumbling with their wallet or their purse. And they can't get to their card to pay the bill. And we're in a hurry. We want to get out and get home. And they're just like, come on, get with it. We're saying to ourselves. Well, he recommends saying, you know, think about the time that you were that person fumbling with your wallet or purse and say to yourself, just like me. You know, that's going to help develop your compassion for your fellow man. We've all been there. We've all annoyed other people. And people can annoy us, but we don't have to stay in that. We can kind of refocus our thoughts a bit. And then another thing he goes over is acceptance. So let's talk about acceptance. He makes a big point of this. Stop trying to change your partner. How many of us have been guilty of that? Uh, we've all done it at one time or another in our life. Some of us are better learners than others and we stop <laughs> trying to make our partner someone who they're not. And, you know, it's a time like this that the serenity prayer may come in handy, he says. God, give me the strength to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. There are some important lessons he has in this book. Another lesson is, it's important for you to have meaning in life. In Japan, there's a word for it. It's called ikigai. Ikigai is why you want to get up in the morning. What is it that is actually making your life meaningful? What do you look forward to? when you're getting out of out of bed in the morning. We all should, at some point, focus on developing something that really uh, is important to us, brings us meaning, and brings us joy to the life. And then the last thing he talks about is forgiveness. And the forgiveness is the issue where we talked about the junk in the trunk. When you carry around resentment from people who've harmed you in your life. And we've all had people who have said things to us that have harmed us in some way, maybe not physically, but mentally. They've told us that we're not so smart or, you know, belittled us in some way. As long as we keep carrying that around, it's like putting another brick in a backpack that you're walking around with all day long. We don't wanna be carrying those bricks around with us. And in order to stop carrying the bricks with those who have hurt you, you need to learn how to forgive. Doesn't need mean you have to tell this person, I forgive you, you're all great, everything's fine. But at some point in your mind, you have to re learn to reframe what happened and allow yourself to forgive uh, what happens in your mind so that you can take that brick out of the backpack and have a lighter load.
he goes over these things in this book. It's a very valuable book, and I'd encourage you to consider getting it, following the exercises. It made a difference in my life. I think it could make a difference in yours. He also mentioned that there are many ways in which you can do meditation. You can do it while you're sitting. You can do it while you're walking. He even says you can do it while you're driving. And of course, when you're eating. How do you do meditation when you're eating an orange or one of these cuties? You look at the orange. It's you hold it in your hand. You roll it around. You ask yourself a question. Where'd this come from? How did it grow? What was its life like in transport to me? Then you can cut into the skin and you can smell that orange flavor. You can feel the texture on the skin and on the inside. You can then put it in your mouth. My mouth is starting to water. <laughs> and you can, you know, actually taste it slowly and savor it as opposed to just throwing it in your mouth, watching TV, talking on the phone, and being mindless. Becoming more mindful is an important concept. And if you do that with a meal at least once a week, maybe even more often, uh, it will allow you to focus your mind on the present and not be so worried about what happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future. You know, many of us spend a lot of time worrying and ruminating. Um, who was it? Mark Train has said, I've suffered many catastrophes, some of which have come true, which means he worried about everything. I worried about everything when I was in medical school. I was sure I had cancer on my legs because there were these bumps. These bumps were lipomas, they're fat accumulation from when I was heavier as a kid. Uh, it took me many years to get rid of my thoughts that this might be a cancer brewing in my body until I felt those bumps on another patient who had been heavy and had lost weight. And I felt them on this other patient. And I said, oh, well, I guess this is a normal finding now. Uh, and it's not cancer. So I'm going to continue on with mood and food. Because you all want to know about does food really affect your mood? And you want to see possibly some science connected with it. And I'll show you a couple few videos. And then we'll see if you have a couple or a few questions. And if not, I'll have another video or two for you. So let's jump on to the mood and food train. And it is right here. First of all, we want to decide are happier people actually healthier? I mean, that's an important question. Does it really make a difference if you develop happiness? Let's take a look. More than 60 years ago, the World Health Organization defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Uh, just because you're not depressed doesn't necessarily mean you're happy. Uh, but if you look at the medical literature, there are 20 times more study published on health and depression than there are on health and happiness. In recent years, though, research on positive psychology has emerged. What we can do to increase our success, functioning, and happiness, all inherently good in themselves, but are happier people healthier people? There's growing evidence that positive psychological well-being is associated with reduced risk of physical illness. Uh, but it's not surprising that healthier people are happier than sick people. The intriguing issue is whether psychological well-being protects against future illness or inhibits the progression of chronic disease. To figure out which came first, you'd have to get more than just a snapshot in time. You'd need 
prospective studies, meaning studies that go forward in time to see if people start out happier, do indeed live longer. And yes, a review of such studies suggests that positive psychological well-being has a favorable effect on survival in both healthy and diseased populations. But not so fast. Yes, positive states may be associated with less stress and inflammation and more resilience to infection, but uh, positive well-being may also be accompanied by a healthy lifestyle that itself reduces the risk of disease. Uh, happy people tend to smoke less, exercise more, drink less, and sleep better. So maybe happiness leads to health only indirectly. However, the apparent protective effect of positive psychological well-being persisted even after controlling for all these healthy behaviors, meaning effectively, even at the same level of smoking, drinking, exercise, and sleep, happier people did seem to live longer. Ideally, to definitively establish cause and effect, we do an interventional trial in which participants are assigned at random to different mood levels and tracked for health outcomes. It's rarely feasible or ethical to randomly make some people's lives miserable to see what happens, but if you pay people enough, you can do experiments like this. It's been thought that people who typically ex report experiencing negative emotions are at greater risk for disease, and those who typically report positive emotions are at less risk, so they decided to test this using the common cold virus. 334 healthy volunteers were assessed for how happy, pleased, and relaxed they were, or how anxious, hostile, and depressed. Subsequently, they were given nasal drops containing cold rhinoviruses to see who would be more likely to come down with a cold. Who would let someone drip viruses in their nose? Someone paid $800, that's who. Okay. Now, just because you get exposed to a cold virus doesn't mean you automatically get sick, because you have an immune system that can fight it off, even if it's dripped right into your nose. The question is whose immune system fights better? In a third of the bummed out folks, their immune systems failed to fight off the virus and they came down with a cold, but only about one in five got a cold in the happy group. Maybe it's because those with positive emotions slept better, more exercise, lower stress? No. It appears even after controlling for the healthy practices and levels of stress hormones, happier people still appear to have healthier immune systems, a greater resistance to developing the common cold. Works with the flu, too. They repeated the study with the flu virus. And like in the earlier study, increased positive emotions was associated with decreased verified illness rates. These results indicate that feeling vigorous, calm, and happy may play a more important role in health than previously thought. So that's one video. Uh, the next video is which foods actually increase happiness. And before we get on to that video, I just want to let you know that they did a study um, where they looked at baseball cards. You know these baseball cards you have the players years ago? Anyway, when I was a kid, I used to trade them or collect them. And they, they, put, they took a couple piles. One pile was with the baseball players who had a big toothy grin smile on their, for their picture. And then they had uh, compared those people um, with uh, the group of people who had a kind of like a deadpan or not much of a smile at all on their face. And they checked their death records. And they found that those with a big tooth grin smile lived on the average seven years longer. So with that information, you may say to yourself, hmm, maybe I do want to eat some foods which may increase my happiness. So let's see which foods will do that. Thousands of papers have been published on the important topic of what determines people's happiness 
and psychological health. But what about the potential influence of the different kinds of foods that people eat? The rising prevalence of mental ill health is causing a considerable burden, and so inexpensive and effective strategies are required to improve the psychological well-being of our population. And now we have a growing body of literature suggesting that dietary intake may have the potential to influence psychological well-being. Dietary intake of what? Well, given the strong evidence base for the health benefits of fruits and vegetables, researchers started there. Cross-sectional studies from all over the world support this relationship between happiness and fruit and vegetable intake. Those eating fruits and vegetables each day had a higher likelihood of being classified as very happy, suggesting a strong and positive correlation between fruit and vegetable consumption and happiness, perhaps feelings of optimism too. The largest such study was done in Great Britain, where a dose-response relationship was found between daily servings of fruits and vegetables and both life satisfaction and happiness, meaning more fruits and veggies meant more happiness. People who got up to seven or eight servings a day reported the highest life satisfaction and happiness. And these associations remain significant even after controlling for factors such as income and illness and exercise, smoking and body weight, suggesting fruit and vegetable consumption wasn't just acting as a marker for other healthy behaviors. But how could eating plants improve happiness on their own? Well, many fruits and veggies contain higher levels of vitamin C, which is a cofactor in the production of dopamine, the zest-for-life neurotransmitter. And the antioxidants reduce inflammation, which may lead to higher levels of eudaimonic well-being. Aristotle's notion of eudaimonia, described as the highest of all human goods, the realization of one's true potential which was the aim of this study. They wanted to know whether eating fruits and vegetables was associated with other markers of well-being beyond happiness and life satisfaction, like greater eudaimonic well-being, a state of flourishing uh, characterized by feelings of engagement, meaning, and purpose in life. So a sample of about 400 adult, young adults followed for about two weeks, and indeed young adults who ate more fruits and veggies reported higher average eudaimonic well-being, more intense feelings of curiosity, greater creativity. And they could follow this on a day-by-day -day basis, greater well-being on the days they ate healthier. These findings suggest that fruit and vegetable intake is related to other aspects of human flourishing beyond just feeling happy. Not so fast, though. Instead of eating good food, food leading to a good mood, maybe the good mood led to eating good food. Uh, experimentally, if you put people in a good mood, uh, they rate healthy foods like apples higher than indulgent foods like candy bars. Given a choice between M&Ms and grapes, individuals in a positive mood were more likely to choose the grapes. The results of these studies lend support to a growing body of research that suggests that positive mood facilitates resistance to temptation. Uh, who needs comfort foods when you're already comforted? It's like which came first, the stricken or the egg? Yes, eating eggs may increase our likelihood of chronic disease, but maybe chronic disease also increases our likelihood of eating unhealthy foods. Which came first, the mood or the food? What we need is a study like this, but instead of looking at well-being and diet on the same day, you see if there's a correlation between what you eat today and how you feel tomorrow. Uh, but we didn't have a study like that until now. They found the same strong relationships between daily positive mood and fruit and vegetable consumption, but lagged analyses showed that fruit and vegetable consumption predicted improvements in positive mood the next day, not vice versa. On days when people ate more fruits and vegetables, they reported feeling calmer, happier, more energetic than they normally do, and they also felt more positive the next day. So eating fruits and vegetables really may promote emotional well-being. Uh, look, single bouts of exercise can elevate one's mood. Why not the same thing with healthy food? How many fruits and vegetables? seems we need to consume approximately 7.2 daily servings of fruit or 8.2 servings of vegetables to notice 
a meaningful change. Okay, and then I have one last video here on this mood and food about blueberries. I eat them every day, and you may choose to do that should you after listening to this video. It's only three minutes. It's a short one. And then we'll break and see what questions you have. The consumption of berries can enhance beneficial signaling in the brain. Plant foods are our primary source of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds, but some plant foods may be better than others, as I've explained before. One cup of blueberries a day can improve cognition among older adults, as shown in this randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, and the same thing in kids after just a single meal of blueberries, though two cups may work better than one. That single hit of berries may also improve mood. A double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study in which kids are asked a series of questions. Uh, are you very slightly or not at all, a little, moderately, quite a bit, or extremely interested, excited, strong, etc.? Before and after drinking the placebo, no significant change. But two hours after consuming about two cups of blueberries, their positive mood scores significantly improved. Uh, they felt more enthusiastic, alert, inspired, attentive, that kind of thing. That was in young adults, ages 18 through 21. Same thing in 7- to 10-year-old children. Some dangerous new mood-enhancing drug or Ritalin? No, blueberries, and just after a single meal. Now, blueberries can't do everything. Although a cup of berries certainly appears to improve brain function, no improvement in walking or balance was observed. Maybe if you tried two cups of blueberries a day? Let's do it. Would six weeks of two cups of frozen blueberries a day affect the functional mobility in adults over age 60? Let's find out. How awesome is it that this study was ever done in the first place? Anyway, randomized to blueberries or carrot juice as a control, uh, measuring things like walking a plank, uh, seeing if you can maintain your balance along a narrow path. Uh, two bright yellow ropes on the floor outlined the narrow path, and participants were instructed to walk down within the roped path. And the blueberries beat out the carrot juice. Significant improvements suggesting blueberry supplementation may provide an effective countermeasure to age-related declines in functional mobility. And looking back, they were thinking maybe they should have used something like cucumber as a control, since the carrots may have offered some benefit as well, making the blueberry results even more impressive. Overall, this study demonstrates the need for greater exploration of blueberry supplementation as a non-pharmacologic countermeasure to the public health issue of age-related declines in independence, or to use the pun version, dietary interventions with phytonutrient-rich foods such as blueberries present a potentially fruitful strategy for combating some of the deleterious effects of age-related neurodegeneration. OK, so we're back again to see if you have any questions, any comments, any thoughts on any of this so far. Uh, I'm going to say I'm be right back with some blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll run. Be right back with blueberries. Uh, who else? Uh, go ahead, Yolanda. So back on the meditation, in 2013, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And every time, you know, you have to go to many, many appointments and have lots and lots of tests done. And then, of course, there's treatment. So it's prolonged. Um, and I was noticing that every time I went in, my blood pressure would go up. And then, because I was scared. And then one day it was 168 over 90 something. And I said, I better do something or I'm going to blow a gasket. That's how I thought of it. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine who's a practicing Buddhist, I went to her 
And I said, would you teach me to meditate? And for one year, she meditated with me once a week. So whenever, as, as things progressed, when I went in for testing or um, treatment, I would meditate almost always on my breath. And I, my, my blood pressure was normal. I wasn't frightened. Um, and I had to have 37 radiation treatments. And it doesn't last very long, but you're in there by yourself. You're in this, this machine is over you and you know you're being radiated. So I would just meditate on my breath. And they asked me later on, how did that all feel? And I said, you know, I went in happy and I came out happy. And the meditation helped me make it through all of that. I, I mean, I, I, it was amazing. Thank you for sharing that Welcome. Uh, with us. Um, I don't know, Arun, if you were done, uh, if you wanted to say something else and then Jamie. Or you're, if you're done, um, it's okay. You got your blueberries. And uh, so let's hear from Jamie. Hi, everybody. So this is slightly related, but not totally. We're talking about how the peacefulness or the stress in your mind will affect your health and your eating habits. My question is about um, your environment your internal body and the question is um i've never heard anybody use the term oxidative stress uh for the standard american diet but wouldn't the standard american diet create in your body incredible oxidative stress um Yes, it's the same thing as free radicals. Yeah, so oxidative stress is just all the free radical release, and that's what you need the antioxidants to to fight against. So the standard American diet full of animal products and processed foods and oils, those all create lots and lots of free radicals, lots of oxidative stress. And then because yeah. that diet is very low in antioxidants, because that's pretty much all in whole plant foods is really high in antioxidants, that's what combats the oxidative stress so yes you're correct standard american diet is loaded with oxidative stress causes lots of inflammation right so you're up the creek without a paddle if you're eating that stuff like the majority of our population yes thanks i just needed that validation i appreciate it yeah. anyone else have a comment would like to share a question they'd like to ask any thoughts uh kim um somebody taught me about glad the um acronym have you heard of that like you no. were talking about when you wake up in the morning and you say your affirmations or something so glad stands for gratitude learning accomplishment or achievement i think and delight so if you kind of go through that list and think of all those things that you are feeling makes you feel good about yourself do that in the morning and then at night and that's just a nice easy way of become you know getting in your mind getting out of your mind and feeling good about yourself and it's like a gratitude practice nice thank easy you to remember and it, uh, the word glad goes along with what you're trying to accomplish. Very good. Arun. Uh, I wanted to say that when I go either, you know, to do some exercise, be it Y or the ocean or go for a jog or whatever, that seems to elevate my mood, you know, make me feel better, make me feel like, okay, I can live a few more days. <laughs> That's being out in nature. Yeah. Yeah. And so being out in nature and, and focusing your attention on that can go a long way to elevating your mood and making you feel better. 
um, it, it's a joyful experience generally. Anybody else? Got to kind of come back to the gallery here. Um, okay. Um, we're going to go on to the um, some other miscellaneous topics about what may uh, actually bring you happiness. Um, and one of the studies is by a Harvard study by uh, who the, the person in charge of that study now is Robert Waldinger. I just, uh, they took people, uh, I think this study has been going on for many, many years now. And they were trying to decide what would really bring true happiness uh, through a lifetime. And so I'm going to share with you what Robert Waldinger has to say about that. I got to go to my share screen first, and I got to get back to, I think, 19. Okay. Yeah. Oops. I put 19 and 20, I think. Yeah, I did. All right. <laughs> And it's Robert Waldinger, What Makes a Good Lo Life? And it's lessons from this Harvard study. And we're going to start it. Stay sharper, and, longer. And they, the people time, some of our octogenarian couples could bicker with each other daily. So this message that good, close relationships are good for our health and well-being. This is wisdom that's as old as the hills. Why is this so hard to get and so easy to ignore? Well, we're human. What we'd really like is a quick fix, something we can get that'll make our lives good and keep them that way. Relationships are messy and they're complicated, and the, the hard work of tending to family and friends, that's not sexy or glamorous. It's also lifelong. It never ends. The people in our 75-year study who were the happiest in retirement were the people who had actively worked to replace workmates with new playmates. Just like the millennials in that recent survey, many of our men, when they were starting out as young adults, really believed that fame and wealth and high achievement were what they needed to go after to have a good life. But over and over, over these 75 years, our study has shown that the people who fared the best were the people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, with community. So what about you? Let's say you're 25, or you're 40, or you're 60. What might leaning into relationships even look like? Well, the possibilities are practically endless. It might be something as simple as replacing screen time with people time, or livening up a stale relationship by doing something new together, long walks or date nights, or reaching out to that family member who you haven't spoken to in years, because those all-too-common family feuds take a terrible toll on the people who hold the grudges. I'd like to close with a quote from Mark Twain. More than a century ago, he was looking back on his life, and he wrote this. There isn't time, so brief is life, for bickerings, apologies, heart burnings, callings to account. There is only time for loving, and but an instant, so to speak, for that. The good life is built with good relationships. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think a run. Did you have your hand up? I think so. 
maybe it was yeah, good evening so i wanted to add one more thing that makes me happy and i'm sure it probably does to quite a few of you when you have set a a goal you know to do something that you really needed to be uh, doing and when you finish it that makes you feel okay some sense of accomplishment and happiness yeah, so having uh, accomplishment and goal can bring you happiness for sure. And um, the relationships you have with other people, according to this Harvard study, which is ongoing for 75 years, uh, shows that they are the most important aspect for your overall happiness. Even I, above. I, I agree. I agree. I, I was just saying what I was going to ask you or suggest before we started the video. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? All right, uh, I don't see anybody else yet. So we have one more issue to go over. Uh, relationships. How do you have good relationships, uh, particularly if you have a significant other, if you're speaking a different language? And uh, that brings us to this next book, which I think is on the website. Scott showed us. It's yep. called... The I can't find myself here, so I can't see if I, I put it on here. Let's see if I can be talking. And where am I? I guess I must be on this next page here. Okay, there it is. It's called The Five Love Languages by uh, Gary Chapman. And so I want to play a quick little video from him, um, which since I'm right close to it it should be here five love languages and many of you have probably read this book but if you haven't uh, you might consider doing it and he will tell you why i'm convinced after 30 plus years now of marriage and family counseling that there's fundamentally five ways to express love emotionally i call them the five love languages I believe there are literally thousands of couples who are as sincere as they can be. They are loving each other, but they're not speaking the right love language. And consequently, the love tank is empty. But everyone grows up speaking a language with a dialect, and that's the one you understand best. The same is true with love. In marriage, almost never does a husband and wife have the same love language. But after we got married, I found out my wife didn't do mornings. <laughs> didn't take me long not to like her. Didn't take her long not to like me. And we succeeded in being utterly miserable. Love language number one, words of affirmation. Using words to affirm the other person. You know, there's an ancient proverb that says life and death are in the power of the tongue. You can kill your spouse or give them life by the way you talk to them. Love is something you do for somebody else, not something you do for yourself. It's universal to give gifts as an expression of love. Y you can get a, a nice card for $5. Can't afford the card? Do you remember how you fold the paper, take the scissors, open up the heart and write, I love you? Cooking a meal is an act of service. Washing dishes is an act of service. Vacuuming the floor, washing the car, mowing the lawn, Anything that you know the other person would like for you to do. Acts of service, a powerful communicator. Love says, honey, you know those apple pies you make? Would it be possible for you to make an apple pie this week? I love your apple pies. Love doesn't say, hadn't had an apple pie since a baby was born. Do you think this in love experience has any relationship to the divorce rate in this country? I believe it is directly tied to the divorce rate. First marriages in this country, 
40% end in divorce. Second marriages, 60% end in divorce. Third marriages, 75% end in divorce. The answer is not running. The answer is learning how to love the person to whom you're now married. Number four is quality time, by which I mean you give the other person your undivided attention. Have you ever tried this? Sitting on the couch with the TV off, looking at each other. It can be scary at first. If you feel loved by your spouse, the whole world looks bright. But if the love tank is empty and you feel like they don't love me, they wish they weren't married to me, the whole world can begin to look dark. Love language number five is physical touch. In marriage, I'm talking about holding hands. I'm talking about kissing. I'm talking about embracing. I'm talking about the whole sexual part of the marriage. Or if you want extra credit, when there's a crowd in the house or you're in public, you walk up and just give them a little hug and kiss on the cheek. Woo, their love tank fills up if this is their primary love language. And the more you touch, the easier it becomes. The whole concept I'm sharing with you is that if we learn to speak the love language of our spouse and of our children, we change the emotional climate in the family. I believe thousands of marriages could be saved if we understood this concept. Any relationship, marriage, family, any relationship can be enhanced if we learn people's love language and we choose to speak it. So, so many things to learn, so many things to discuss. Um, we've just kind of scratched the surface of a number of things. We haven't gone into cognitive behavioral therapy, um, I haven't touched on that a lot or much of it at all. Um, we didn't really spend enough time on forgiveness. Um, at one point in past classes, uh, when I was in Roseburg, we did a full hour and a half class on forgiveness, listened to a few visit videos and shared some stories with each other about how some people have learned to forgive the unforgivable. Um, and they were very powerful kind of classes. And uh, maybe one of these days we might incorporate those again. But um, just there is a lot for us to kind of take in and um, improve our lives by, by thinking about these various topics. We've tried to stimulate your interest today. Any other thoughts? All very deep topics <laughs> to think about, but it's so important because, you know, we, I mean, with lifestyle medicine, you know, we talk about the six pillars, but, you know, you gotta have, if you don't have happiness, purpose, meaning in your life, then, you know, what, what's it all for, right? So that's, that's what we, Got to spend some time on on these topics. And we'll be getting back to food soon enough. But what next class is going to be an open forum? And no, then... actually, actually, you were today was just part two of your uh, of uh, how our mind affects our health. Next week is food and mood. Oh, okay, so we'll just have to add some other issues. Maybe we're going to do the forgiveness next week. Yeah, you had still, I saw a bunch of videos for food and mood you didn't get a chance to get to today. You can do those next week too. Then okay. the week after that is, the week after that is, uh, is a uh, open forum. So you get, you get three weeks for those two topics. Uh, that was very kind of you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, many of you have the basis of uh, some of the topics we're going to talk about, and we will just go into it in more depth, uh, various aspects next week, because I do have a number of things that I wasn't able to get to uh, tonight. So we'll see what you're interested in next week. Um, it's been great fun. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next week. It seems like everybody's good, unless there's someone else who says, wait a second.
Okay. Uh, are you saying goodbye, Karen? <laughs> no, you want to talk? Uh, you can unmute. Oh, you're just saying goodbye. Okay. All right, everybody, Scott, thank you a bunch. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all here again next week. Thank, thank you. you for a great class. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night.